It's the unofficial start of summer, and I'm at the pool, which reminds me of my days as a lifeguard. I'm Mary McGee Pasternak, Congregational Care Coordinator, and welcome to the fourth midweek devotional. Today, I'm going to talk about faith and potential. One of my duties as a lifeguard was teaching swimming lessons, and this time I had five adults in the beginner class. Now these people had put off learning how to swim for years and had built up all kinds of fears about the water. On the very first day of class, we were standing at the edge of the pool about midway, and all of a sudden, Carla lost her footing and fell into the pool, making a huge splash. Poor Carla started thrashing and flailing. She was wild-eyed and trying to scream, and all she knew in that moment was that since she was in the water, she was going to die. She was terrified. Her fear narrowed her perspective, and it does ours too. It's hard to see the potential in our adversity. Our brains are actually wired for routine and sameness. In fact, about 90% of what we do is automatic. 90%. We go through our day in much the same way. We don't have to think about how to brush our teeth or how to eat or get dressed or go about our day to day until something disrupts that. We crave sameness. That resistance to change is deep in our biology. It's a survival skill. Sameness equals safety and difference equals discomfort or potential danger. According to a Harvard psychiatrist, we would rather master the disappointment of what we no longer have than we are willing to try something new. Rather than becoming really good at being able to tolerate when things don't work out, we need to change our perspective. Take the children of Israel. In Exodus, the children of Israel had witnessed many miracles, signs, and wonders of God's power, including all of the plagues of their enemies. They were allowed to escape years of brutal slavery through a parted Red Sea and carried with them some of the riches of their captors. After a successful escape, there was much singing and praising of God. They were so grateful to have seen an end of generations of cruel taskmasters and backbreaking hard, hard labor. Initially, they encountered difficulty even finding water in the desert, and when they did find water, it was undrinkable. But God intervened and made the water drinkable. Food was scarce, and he sent manna, and later on, when they craved meat, he sent quail. Their needs were met but it wasn't in the form that they were used to. About a month into their new normal, they wanted to go back to what they knew. They murmured against Moses and wanted to go back to Egypt. 200 years of bondage wiped away. It seems like the fear of not knowing what comes next is more powerful than what they had been through. They had been told about a promised land. They were even given a description of it, a land flowing with milk and honey, but they couldn't figure out how they were going to get there, and they didn't trust that it was going to happen. Right now, in 2020, we may wonder the same thing. We want so much to get back to normal, but do we really? Read the headlines from May of 2019. Do we really want to go back to the stress of busyness, too many tasks and not enough time to do it, overscheduling, running here, running there, loneliness becoming epidemic, heart disease on the rise, sitting the new health risk worse than smoking, and suicide rate increasing by 30%. This situation, this pandemic has grabbed our attention and we have the potential to move forward. As human beings, we tend to push away discomfort and just try to get back to feeling good. We want to go back on autopilot. 
What will future generations say about how we handle this time? God has given us the gift of free will, and using that requires slow, deliberate, intentional thinking. We can choose what we think about, and we can choose what to focus on. That doesn't mean we put on rose-colored glasses and ignore problems. Oh, it's exactly the opposite. Again, neuroscience comes in and supports the Bible's teaching. The Broaden and Build theory says that under the influence of positive emotions like joy and gratitude, we broaden our awareness. This encourages and ignites creativity, exploratory thoughts and actions. Over time, this broadened perspective expands our thinking and builds our resources. We become better, more creative, more efficient problem solvers. The Bible's version of it comes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul tells us how to program our thoughts by focusing on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and worthy of praise. The key here is not to only name those things, but to re-experience them with full emotion. Become immersed in them for a time. This is difficult sometimes when we're under stress, but it's worth a try. You can use it as your evening or morning devotional time. When you come up against a problem, name it, then step away from it. Remember and re-experience something positive in your life and really get back into that moment and give God specific gratitude for your many blessings. And you can find a wealth of praiseworthy topics in the Bible, particularly Psalms. And after a time, go back to whatever problem you're facing and see if some more options come up or perhaps you see more opportunities reveal. And don't be surprised if it's something completely different than what you're expecting. This broadening of perspective gives us a different view of our circumstance. And even in the midst of our adversity, we can find compassion for others. Consider the two thieves who are crucified with Jesus. Both men were facing the same unspeakably agonizing situation but they had very different responses. Luke's account in chapter 23 tells us that one of the men wanted immediate relief from his suffering, saying, aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and save us. He was very short-sighted, but the other man had a different perspective. While hanging on a cross, he recognized that Jesus was being punished when he had done nothing wrong. He recognized Jesus' sovereignty when he said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had the wide-angle lens of eternal life and was ultimately granted access to paradise with Jesus because he had a change of heart and a change of perspective. It's in our nature to want to go back to what we're used to but we can override this. We have the opportunity to lead a more intentional life, more purposeful thinking, off autopilot. Just going through the motions isn't a life fully lived. In the midst of this crisis, we are valuing relationships. We are checking on each other. Living in quarantine has made us look at our relationships with our families. Businesses are learning to pivot and reinvent themselves. We are seeing more creativity, more acts of extraordinary generosity. We are becoming more caring. Our perspective is changing in the direction of leading more Christian lives. But how are we going to keep going in the right direction when the pressure is off? Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. What potential good is going to be brought forth from this challenging time? How is God going to use this global pause? I can't imagine it yet, 
but I am convinced that there is great potential in all of it. It's sometimes hard to imagine that a woolly caterpillar turns into a beautiful butterfly or that a mighty oak comes from an acorn because the beginnings look nothing like the end. But I trust the creator of the universe even when I can't see the how. I know the final outcome. From up on the pool deck, I yelled, Carla, relax, you're okay. Put your feet down and stand up. You're on solid ground. She was in shoulder deep water. All of that needless struggle when she was inches away from being able to stand. The Bible tells us that this life isn't always going to be easy. But if we stand on his promises, promises that he has made over and over, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, we too can be still and know we're on solid ground. We can stand on his promises. Our promised land is ahead of us, and we can trust God to get us there. This is an opportunity to make needed changes. Perhaps future generations will look at this time in our history as a time when we came together, when we looked out for each other, when we went in a new direction. Let our love of God fuel our faith and ignite our creativity. And let our trust in God overcome fear. And let us step out of our autopilot comfort zone and stay on this positive path even when the pressure is released. We can choose to come out of this with more compassion, better understanding, less judgmental, and we can be better, more loving Christ followers. Our God is good all the time. If we can remember not to forget. Most holy God, we love you and are so grateful that you are always as close as our next breath. We thank you for the life of your beloved son, Jesus, who by his choice and love of you and us endured the pain of all the sins of the world so that we may live with you when our days on earth are done. Open our minds and our hearts with a new perspective so that we may see the potential in this time to continue on a path most pleasing to you. We ask this in your son's most holy name. Amen.